years are one way of reckoning time and significant events. But there are other ways. Cycles of moon, sun, stars, plantings, harvests, even lifetimes. To appreciate the story of resourceful ancient farmers and their lives in the Sonoran Desert, as well as the story of how we know their stories, it helps to think in terms of lifetimes, of people, their children, their dogs, their dwellings, their hopes, their worries, their quest for understanding. 198 great-grandmothers ago, around 2100 BC, farmers settled in landscapes such as the Tucson Basin, marking the beginnings of a new way of life in ancient North America. For more than 200 generations, their descendants harvested maize and later also beans and squash through innovative irrigation farming. When Europeans arrived in the Sonoran Desert in the late 1600s, some 20 generations ago, they observed the villages these farmers had lived in. One such place is a site known as Pueblo Grande. Even today, this village is partly preserved by the city of Phoenix. Visitors can see traces of the massive irrigation systems its residents built. Whether traveler, homesteader, or scientist, newcomers to the region asked, how did these people survive and thrive in this desert? What were those canal systems watering? When did people take up those crops? When did they begin irrigating their plots? Archaeologists have been asking those same questions since the 1880s, five or six generations ago. But there was so much to study, very little funding, and few researchers on the ground, until two generations ago, until 1966. Fifty years ago, we didn't know much about the desert farmers archaeologists call the Hohokam. Thanks in large part to the NHPA, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, archaeologists have learned more about the Hohokam. I'm standing in front of the big house at the Casa Grande National Ruins uh, on the Middle Gila River. Uh, this was a Hohokam ceremonial administrative center that probably was first established around 700 AD and lasted then until about 14 or 1450 AD. These are the words of Captain Mange, a Spaniard whose visit to the Casa Grande in November 1697 impressed him greatly. In the five miles surrounding the Casa Grande, there are many ruins and mounds. From this, I conclude that this was once a large city of civilized people. This is confirmed by the presence of a main irrigation canal that was 30 feet wide and 12 feet deep. In the 1930s, at a site called Snake Town, Arizona archaeologist Emil Hari discovered definitive evidence of a people who dwelled in pit houses, made a diversity of crafts, built extensive irrigation systems, and gathered in ball courts. Snake Town revealed much about these early canal builders, the Hohokam. In the early 1900s, these early surveyors like Frank Midvale really were the ones who mapped out the basic framework of all the canal systems that we now know exist in the Phoenix Basin. And then later, researchers like Emil Howery, with their first studies at Snake Town here on the Gila River Indian community, were the first to really start to expose what we came to know about what Hohokam canal systems were like, how big the canals and the canal systems were, and how much labor and effort really went into building and maintaining these canals. Howry trained three generations of students, many of who went on to study the Hohokam. In 1966, a world of unknown evidence came nearer to hand. In 1966, the National Historic Preservation Act became law. After the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act, archaeologists started working not because they were driven by important sites like Snake Town, but because of development. And one of the earliest developments in Arizona was called the Central Arizona Project. And because the Central Arizona Project took water from the Colorado River and delivered it all throughout the state to up until Tucson, um, there was a huge swath of areas that had never been looked at. Almost two generations ago, beginning in the 1970s, residential and commercial development skyrocketed in the Tucson Basin, necessitating infrastructure improvements. 
and thanks to the NHPA, which requires archaeological work to be done ahead of federal projects, evidence of the Hohokam's ancestors, who were irrigation farmers in their own right, began to come to light. Work at Tucson area sites such as Santa Cruz Bend, Los Pozos, and Las Capas reveal these earlier farmers. And the Central Arizona Project was the first of thousands of archaeological projects taken since 1966, so that all of a sudden everything in Arizona archaeology was being rewritten. And one of those things happened just on the other side of here, on the Santa Cruz River. The uh, field systems at Las Capas are uh, fed by a main canal that's taken off of the Santa Cruz River and the water is brought into essentially a grid garden. The distribution canals feed these cells on either side so you can make a very compact yet uh, efficient system uh, for water distribution. The fields we were able to expose over an area of uh, close to five acres uh, by using backhoes equipped with special uh, blades on the, on the arms to strip away the uh, floodplain sediments and expose the fields uh, broadly in plan view. Um, we're able to identify the fields based on differences in soil or sediment color and texture. It, it allows us to get a big picture uh, window uh, of how the system was, was actually constructed and laid out. To me, some of the most important new information that has come out of these archaeological efforts to comply with the National Historic Preservation Act for major transportation projects is the new knowledge we have of changes in settlement and social organization of the first farmers in the Sonoran Desert. We have evidence that they were starting to settle down and occupy the same places for extended periods of time. And in these social changes and settlement changes, we see the roots of southwestern villages. We estimate the population of Las Capas to have been about 80 to maybe 100 people. We find houses in clusters of three to five structures. There's shallow pits with a brush superstructure built um, within it. We call them pit houses or houses in pits. Where originally we thought the whole com had brought agriculture, but it turns out that someone else brought agriculture thousands of years before them and brought not just agriculture, but village life and everything associated with farming. So the act and the set of laws that protected archeological sites had not just the effect of protecting our heritage, but fundamentally changing our view of who we are and how we came to be who we are. And one of the things that the past 15 years of archeology span has demonstrated is, is that you're never gonna find early agricultural or an earlier occupation below the Hohokam unless you push below the Hohokam. We know now that the earliest evidence we actually have for how planting took place was already a fairly sophisticated kind of irrigation. That's a big surprise for many of us because we have corn here that dates earlier still, between 3,000 and 4,000 years ago. And to the archaeological evidence, we've added a consideration of linguistics and human genetics. How they lived, who they were, what they spoke. Each new find reveals the story of these farmers and the deep heritage of their descendants among us today. In the winter of 2016, Archaeologists and community members got a very personal glimpse of a few of these villagers. While excavating an archaeological site prior to bridge construction, an odd depression caught the eye of Dan Arnett, an archaeological backhoe operator. And he's so amazing that he can be digging down through you know, different lenses of compact soils and when he gets to something that just feels slightly different, I mean we're talking compaction levels that are minor, 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 even to us sitting with, with the trowel, and sure enough he finds what he distinguished he thought was a heel cup. And then sure enough he found a big toe and he equates it to winning the Powerball. In an instant, new understandings of life in these villages came down to something visceral and human the footprints of men and women out working in their fields after a flood. In my family, we are always talking about historical and traditional discussions. And for the footprints, 
We talked as we left. We talked when we arrived at home. We talked at other family functions and gatherings and shared with other family members about how important this discovery was and how much it meant to us, those that were able to see it. To show my grandson evidence of existence of our people from many, many years ago. Something that you will never learn or see in a classroom setting. Some 200 generations later, the Sunset Footprints brought the great-grandchildren of their makers toe-to-toe -to -toe with their ancestors. They brought those descendants together with other community members. And, as regulations require, they brought archaeologists and descendant peoples together in consultation. The law brings tribes together in consultation in an effort to try to minimize, avoid uh, those properties that are significant to tribes. And a lot of times, uh, these projects are off community lands, uh, reservation lands, but are within the ancestral lands of the tribes that they're consulting with. We're getting a greater effort from uh, federal agencies to assist tribes in trying that very thing to minimize and address uh, tribal concerns related to what they call adverse effects. Well, I think opportunities like this are incredibly important for uh, public education and public outreach and getting uh, the community to understand the value of uh, understanding and caring about the past and caring about uh, preservation and uh, how we go about actually learning from the past and how archaeological projects locally happen in the first place so that if people can see concretely um, what it is, what information we can we can glean about the past when we do things like this. Not only is it preservation for the tribal folks, the tribal members, but it's also preservation for this place they call America, because not many people understand what we've already been told about these things. I came into archaeology in 1972, so the National Historic Preservation Act has really had a lot of the same trajectory as, as my personal uh, career in archaeology. And what I've been so impressed with over time is to see the great uh, new insights that we've gotten to local areas, the collaboration between researchers, the outreach to the public, and the collaboration in particular with, with tribes, the folks that are still here on this landscape in the Southwest, and the ways in which archaeologists and Native peoples are uh, collaborating together to implement this law in a very creative and productive way. The people that have walked before us have blessed these grounds and have instilled in us to be who we are, to live in some of the, what people call some of the harshest conditions, but we believe it is heaven to us. We have everything that we need here in the desert. The archaeology that's going on here right now is fantastic and when you add the human element of seeing an actual footprint and a child's footprint from you know anywhere from 2500 to 3000 years ago is it, it boggles the mind i'm just grateful that they are even doing this and letting us see this it's wonderful the uh, hohokam were expert irrigators and the technology they used is the same stuff we use today. It just they had to do it with dirt and sticks and things. Regardless of who you are and where you come from, you must have a foundation.